typically come ticket purchasers, auction supporters. So we 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 were able to to figure out who the supporters of the event were, and then that kind of helped us move forward of like how can we try to engage these people with all of the unknowns and all of the challenges ahead of us. Um, so the first thing that we did was we decided that the utmost importance was to reach out to our major event supporters and our major donors and communicate what was going on with the organization, where we were at, what we were experiencing in the field, um, and just make sure that they knew how important their support was for us and that we wouldn't depend on it even more than ever with um, kind of just an unknown future. Um, so that was like our first step. And that's uh, at the end of the presentation, I kind of have these takeaways. So that's like one of the, it seems very silly, but just figuring out who you are trying to reach and then what appeals to them. Um, so we, once we had that, our major donors, our major event supporters uh, kind of brought into the loop. Um, we did have one-on-one -on -one calls with with each uh, supporter and um, we wrote love notes, we sent seeds, we just made sure that they knew how much we, we appreciated their support. Um, so then for that other cohort of like ticket uh, purchasers and auction supporters and uh, our social media followers, um, we kind of had to brainstorm like how do we want to engage them around fundraising um, for our annual benefit? So we ultimately decided last year that we would put together these short videos communi communicating our mission and our need. Um, and I'll speak kind of more about those videos a little bit um, in a few minutes. And then we decided because the um, food justice was such a hot topic and still is um, with COVID, we knew that we could kind of leverage our garden and um, the good deeds that we do through that, through giving all the produce to the community center. Um, we knew that that would be um, something that people could really rally around and um, would engage our, our supporters at all levels. Um, so we decided to do that. And then we did uh, specialty cocktail grill bags for our major supporters that we dropped um, off at their homes. Um, and this was kind of cute. We did a uh, mountain mint in a grill bag with honey and vodka. And um, it was like a, like a, a mint uh, spiked lemonade or something. And um, that was something that we really didn't communicate, but was really appreciated by supporters after the fact. Um, so we did that and then we did have an online auction um, since it was virtual. Um, we kind of knew that was something we could at least, um, we knew we could move ahead with. <laughs> um, so that was that was our plan for, for 2020 and it was successful. Um, this is a little bit about our videos. We did, um, we ended up creating seven or eight videos all um, about three minutes or less so that we could um, post them on our social media and put them in e-blasts. And we knew we had to keep them short to kind of keep people's attentions. Um, and we decided that um, we would have a better chance to um, engage more people if they were shorter many videos than one longer video. Um, and we also had to make the decision about whether we wanted to do a live portion of the event or not. And again, we looked at our supporters we acknowledged that they aren't the most tech savvy. Um, so we decided from that, that we wouldn't do a live component. We would do these pre-recorded videos. They were all produced in-house, taken with our cell phones, really like low cost. Um, I think all we paid for was um, to, to have a uh, something to hold the, the camera so that we could tape people. Um, but it was great. It was a great way to communicate the importance um, of preserving our lands during COVID. Um, we were able to communicate how many people we were seeing on our lands and um, really emphasize um, the relevancy of our organization and our mission and the need. Um, and we did, um, end up engaging a lot of people through these videos. So um, the, I think it's the last video on this list, the barred owl release at Pinecroft has uh, about 350 views. So when you consider that we typically engaged, you know, 300 to 350 people at our event in person, not saying that a three minute video has the same sort of impact, but we did, we were able to, um, to engage a, a number of people and we ended up 
um, reaching our goal, we, we actually, of course, because of COVID, we reduced our typical $250,000 goal to 150. And then we did surpass that we ended up um, netting $210,000 last year from this event. So um, we were pretty psyched about that. And we feel like, uh, sure, we certainly learned a lot of lessons, but um, being that we had three months to kind of pivot, we were happy with the outcome. Um, so some insights gained from that experience, we found that if you're have if you're not having an event, if you're just doing something virtual, the people who purchase a ticket just to come to an event, they're not going to support the event. <laughs> so uh, this might seem pretty obvious, but it was something that we had to kind of come to realizations about. Um, and then, you know, it kind of that helped us lead into how can we engage those ticket goers this year. So I'll kind of be talking about that in a few minutes. Um, but something else that we learned is um, don't disrupt the calendar of giving. We found that a lot of our supporters are used to giving that early June, late May date, and whether we had an event or not, they kept that calendar in their mind. And we, we continue to see this. We have, um, you know, some of our supporters reach out in the beginning of the year. Are you still going to need this level of support from me for this benefit? And we're like, yes, absolutely. So I really would stress that if anybody is thinking about pivoting anything, um, any events, try to keep them at the same time that you would do your in-person one. We found that it was a great way to kind of bridge us until we're able to do it in person again. Um, use your board as test groups. We had a lot of focus groups with our boards of like, what do you think about this idea? What do you think about that? And the feedback from our board was just so important and um, really helped us kept, keep moving forward. Um, and then the last kind of insight gained from 2020 was when times are uncertain, plan around what you know. Like I said, who, who are your supporters? What do you know will be true in three months? And even when there's so much unknown, there are a few knowns, even if it's that you're not going to be able to have an in-person event. You're not going to be able you know, use those um, to help guide what you can do. Um, so that was last year. Now this year, um, we have shifted again. We, we knew we weren't gonna be able to have another 300 person event. Um, so for this year's fundraiser, we ultimately decided that we're going to have our annual benefit, um, but it'll look different. And then we are gonna do a fall event to try to bridge um, the revenue that we need to make from these events. So for our annual benefit this year, uh, we'll be hosting intimate tours on our protected properties for our top donors. So for our typical table hosts, we're kind of shifting them to these intimate tours. We did uh, really one-on-one -on -one outreach with our easement holders that, um, that we knew their land was really special and that people would be intrigued to get on. Um, so we've been doing that one-on-one -on -one outreach and we have um, five different sites secured at this point. Um, so each for that level, it'll be um, each supporter of the 250, I'm, I'm sorry, $2,500 level and up will get four tickets to one of these intimate tours. Um, so that's kind of for our major event supporters. And then for our ticket holders, our traditional ticket holders, since we saw a, a drop off last year, we're trying to do something specifically to keep that support. Um, so we're going to be doing these gift baskets and excursions at our preserved trailheads, and those will be themed um, to try to engage um, the $250 around their supporters. Um, and then, like I said, we'll be doing a family-friendly harvest event um, on September 18th that we're hoping we can have, um, you know, higher number of people to, um, to kind of, like I said, bridge what we um, now are not forecasting we'll make through this event, um, through a fall event. So the goal of these events with our annual benefit, of course, in addition to raising money, is to get people onto the land and connecting with the land. So we're really excited that, um, I mean, the, the gala is great and it makes so much money and it's so great to have that many people in one room at one time that you can engage. But this, these events now tie so closely to our mission. We're really, we're getting such positive feedback about that and there's really ex excitement. So uh, we're really looking forward to what this year holds. Um, and then just a little bit about that fall event that we're planning. We're hoping it can be about 150 people. Um, 
we kind of began to shift in February when we knew that the vaccines were rolling out. We were um, we then felt hopeful that we could do something bigger in September. Um, and and the event format can um, can change, can shift based on the COVID precautions. We can do a drive-in style, or we can do picnic blankets if we're allowed to be um, closer to people. So that's kind of what we have planned for this year. And then I did just want to put together these lesson learned because um, we did learn so many lessons that I feel like are so valuable to pass along. Um, so I do just want to go through these real quick if I have time, Chris. I don't know if I'm cutting it close, but I'm good. Okay. So um, kind of lessons learned. Uh, like I said, stay in front of your donors. That was like our biggest like aha moment at the beginning of this, this whole uh, COVID pandemic. Um, so we continued that. I mean, we, we called every major donor in the spring and then throughout all last year, we send notes. We, you know, we couldn't invite people out to our land, but we found ways to stay in front of them. Um, and then support looks different to different people and don't leave anybody out. So um, we were really able to convert a lot of our social media followers into uh, financial supporters through the event last year because it was a real digital campaign um, and we did stress um, support at any level so we really tried to encourage those ten dollars those twenty dollar donations no amount was too small um, and we were excited to see that that conversion um, rally support around a common cause our fund in need around the garden was pretty successful because we were able to fundraise around something that we knew was really relevant and would resonate with our supporters. Um, communicate what your organization is experiencing and then say that over and over again. Um, I'm sure many of you feel the same way. I feel like I talk about our garden program so much. Like everybody in the world must know at this point because I have told so many people, but I still get calls of like, what, you guys do a garden? Where does the food go? And I'm like, oh my gosh. So you really need to like shout it from the rooftops and write it a million times um, in order for it to resonate. <laughs> um, and then the last tip, um, which we really tried to um, kind of bring into the fold this year is as much as you can tie your fundraising efforts into your mission, the more that it'll resonate with your supporters, be unique to your organization and excite people. Um, so that's kind of what we found. Those are our lessons learned. And I hope um, you can kind of bring them back to your organization and, um, and learn, learn some things to <laughs> not make these mistakes <laughs> in order to learn them. Um, so that's what I have to say. I hope it was helpful. I know I kind of raced through it, but I know we have a few other presentations to get into. So um, that's my information if you have any questions. Now with the love notes, were those sent electronically or in, uh, by, by mail? And do you ask for money in the love notes or not? No, no, we don't ask for money in the love notes. They're handwritten, they're mailed. We really feel like the snail mail, like people appreciate that more than ever with so many things being digital. It's so easy to overlook a personal email or just feel like it was copy and pasted to several people or BCC, you know? So we feel like that handwritten is so worth the extra effort and we don't ever ask for money through that. Um, we really try to stick by the seven touches to, before you ask for a gift. Um, I just wanted to mention the video Any questions. The, the video piece uh, I find was just that's just awesome. And I think such a great lesson because our smartphones make really nice cameras. And even just with a simple smartphone, um, you can do a lot. And, and I remember learning in a, a fundraising session years ago that so they make great thank you videos too to like a big donor. You could scan your phone and maybe they help plant a new garden or wildflower meadow and you can say thank you for your support and look at what you helped create it. and you're just 30 seconds of a video. So thanks for sharing that. It's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. You're so right. And we feel like, um, you know, people don't have the attention spans anymore to read a whole blog post or a whole article or whatever you're putting out there. Um, so videos are a way to keep people's attention and to communicate a message that may not be able to be done in two sentences, you know, so, and it brings people out to the land, you know, we have a lot of older supporters that, um, that can't necessarily get out on the properties that we protect, even though it's so important to them. 
So it's a nice way to show them what we're doing, what's, you know, what areas we're we protecting and what are we doing on the land? Yeah. Thanks. Great, great job, Michelle. That was awesome. And I, I appreciate it. That was a lot of fun. I think I, I took some notes. I learned some stuff. That was great. Does anybody else have any nice. more questions for Michelle before we move on? So Louise, I think you're the, the next presenter. Okay. Um, let me share my screen. Um, I that is a hard act to follow. Hold on, let me just. It's always hard to for me to. Does anybody have any tips on how to go? Oh, here we go. Um, it always covers up my ability to go to slideshow. Something I have not figured out in one year. But <laughs> here we go. Um, <laughs> So I, that is a really hard act to follow. I have some quick, easy, like much smaller scale ideas that basically have been used by the towns that are on the pollinator pathway. So much, uh, much, much less <laughs> impressive than what we just heard about. But one of the things that um, has really sort of just, it, it, we came up with these little metal signs to mark um, for people to put on their mailboxes, or you can put it on a stake and put it in a, um, you know, public garden in your town to show that that spot is on the pollinator pathway. So we, these are much cheaper if you order them in bulk. So um, the steering committee orders them at a thousand at a time, so we can get them for like three fifty each. Versus if you order a smaller amount, it's like seven dollars or ten dollars each. So we started um, offering them to towns as they got organized. Well, so we offer these as available for $10, don suggested $10 donation on the website. And then we thought, well, towns that are joining could actually get these from us at cost and then use them as a fundraiser to get started. So, um, so that's what we offer to new towns, especially. And a lot of times the pollinator pathway is usually comes together in a town is like a, uh, volunteers from various different organizations. So it's not necessarily a 501c3. They're not in a position to do any real fundraising. So this is just a get started way. Um, and any town, anybody's um, that's working on the pollinator pathway is like welcome to just contact us. Um, you just email Pam at pollinatorpathwayne at gmail.com. And so we have these six inch signs that you can get for 350 plus whatever it costs to ship them to you. And then we, because we asked for a donation of $10 on the website, people, we say we, it actually costs like 350 to mail them. So we're really just covering our costs with that $10. But if you pick them up from us um, or we mail them to you and then you distribute them in your town and you ask for a donation of $10, a lot of times you'll get a lot more than $10. I mean, it's, you know, if you ask for a minimum do donation of $10, you'll, um, you can do, you can rate, you can, you'll you can you see like a $25 or $50 donation sometimes. So it just opens the door. Um, for people to get engaged, and then again, as as Michelle said, we're we're accomplishing our goal. We're getting these signs out there. I mean, the the goal is to get rid of those yellow pesticide application signs and start to see more of these um, pollinator pathway signs. So we we just upped it and ordered some twelve inch signs that have like a brighter color. Um, so for larger um, public gardens and stuff, or even in people's yards. So those are going to be available at cost for $8. And then, um, we're going to be asking for $20 online. So that's just an idea. Um, it's, a, you know, anyone can do this and just let us know if you, um, if you want some signs. And then I also wanted to, I, somebody else on the call might even know more about this than I do, but lots of towns. I, I was just at a talk with, um, Abe who organizes, the match funding for sustainable CT and 17 pollinator pathway towns um, have, have done this. These are three projects right now that are going on. So this again works for small groups that you don't have to be a 501c3. This is a quick turnaround. I think you hear back from them in a few days. Um, there's minimal recording requirements afterwards and you can raise up, you can get match funding of up to $25,000. So this is like, um, you have to, the, you do, it is match funding. So you have to do, most people do the, an online fundraising thing nowadays in COVID. Um, so maybe like through Facebook or something, but it's a great idea. And lots of um, different town pollinator pathways have had success using this. 
And then I threw in one more idea, Chris, that I didn't even tell you about. <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with One Tree Planted. I We just started working with them um, last year and it's also worked out really well for small, even though their main focus is to do large reforestation projects, which some land trusts here today might be interested in that part of it. It also works for smaller um, pollinator plantings because the way they're set up, they they get funders and like this year, they had lots of funding for Connecticut and New York and they were actively looking. I think I put in the um, H2H um, listserv, like a heads up about it. Um, I think that they, they've they closed their, um, their small $1,500 grant session for now, but it's just worth knowing about the way they fund things is they'll do um, a volunteer, if you can get $1,500 for a volunteer planting. So like the Norwalk Land Trust is gonna do one. What, what I did was I started looking at, we have all these small um, organizations that are working together to plant for pollinators. Maybe I could get a group of them. So we ended up getting eight towns involved this spring and eight, 19 conservation organizations. And it's gonna be held, like all the plantings are gonna happen through 17 different volunteer events. So we really just grouped all these different projects under one grant funding um, umbrella. And that worked for One Tree Planting and they brought in, they actually introduced us to one of their Connecticut donors, KJ Tree out of Hamden. Um, so we're now we're working with them and to do, so each little project was $1,500. They also will do reforestation projects that are unlimited. So if you have a, you know, a large area that you could put in seedlings um, and seedlings are usually about a dollar each, uh, they'll cover the cost up to a dollar. So, and that's an unlimited um, opportunity. So I just thought I'd throw that out there because it, once we started talking to them, they're sort of, willing to work with you, whatever your situation is. I was like, you know, I have all these towns and they want to do plantings and, and how could we um, tweak this a little bit? And we ended up uh, doing that grouping. So that worked really well. And that is my, those are my three little small, quickie, um, informal fundraisers that have been working for Pollinator Pathway Towns um, this year and, and last year, especially. And I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has um, anything or any other ideas like this that you think of, you know, once I said I was going to talk about the signs, I started thinking, oh, there's these other like little quick informal things that have been working. Um, so I added the other two. I have a yeah, question. Lisa, I think that's great. The, um, as, as we think about fundraising and strategies that are appropriate for different groups, I think it's really important to consider, you know, all scales. Yeah, And these seem like they're super uh, appropriate for a lot of our partners. So I really appreciate this. This is really good. Um, yeah, does anybody have any more questions for Louise? I have a question. Um, I totally agree. I, 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 there are a lot of partners that um, are all volunteer and this is an amazing thing that anybody can do at any level. Um, and we actually have been, we have a stack of, of pollinator pop-up uh, or pollinator pathway signs yeah, that yeah. Um, we have to start communicating that we have and selling. Um, but I just, any tips on like, have you guys run like any like online campaigns or has it just really been like through word of mouth of like, we have these, these signs if you'd like them and you know, you have a, a donation on your website or something. Um, I guess, you know, it, a lot of it comes through when, when new towns are joining, when I do, I'll like do a talk at there, like we want to start a pollinator pathway in our town. One of the things I mentioned is that this is a good starter, um, fundraising tool, but you know, we do have, um, a list of the town leaders. So if you wanted to send out an e a group email to like the New York, the Westchester, um, town organizers and say, we've got these signs, it's a good fundraiser, um, you know, I, we could help you, you could do that through. Yeah, I'm just curious if like anyone has done like a native plant, like if maybe Aspatuck has done something like that with their native plant sales of like, you know, to include a sign for an extra $10, you know, yeah, something like I mean, that. Mel is here, so we'll hear if she did, yeah. but. Um, <laughs> Sorry, maybe I'm jumping the gun. <laughs> but you know, also the way the one tree planted thing, we reached out to the garden clubs in lots of the towns. Well, the towns in the watershed where I am, so my seven towns. I reached out to the garden clubs, and we were like, 
you're going to be having a sale this spring anyway, would you want to give away a tree seedling? So that's one of the parts of this is that we got these seedlings and same can go for a sign. Like you can have the signs there when back in the day when things used to be in person, I would just have a basket and, you know, like a donate, suggested donation, $10, you know, if you're on the pathway. So, um, it was easier before. <laughs> yeah, tab Shut tabling down. and such, right? And yeah. Send out an email and just say, you know, we have these, we're supporting the pollinate. Remind Westchester um, people who've signed up in Westchester that you guys are, are organizing for, for mm. the um, You can do that. Great, that was, uh, that was very informative. Does anybody else have any questions? All right, Sophie, I think you're, uh, you're up next. All right. So as Chris mentioned, I am the development and communications man manager for Greenwich Land Trust. And I have been in this role or a similar role at least um, for going on five years. So I've been organizing our special events that whole time and every year things change a little bit, uh, but nothing like last year. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about shifting in-person events to take our COVID safety protocols and guidelines into account. Um, by the time our event typically, I'm gonna be talking about our an evening at the farmstead cocktail party. Um, I'm gonna just sort of use that as my main example. The event is usually um, like late spring, early summer, end of May, early June. Um, and honestly, by that time, the feedback that we had received was people were sick of the virtual events already. They didn't want anything live. They just like weren't interested. So um, we're gonna talk about something a little taboo, but we're <laughs> gonna talk about gathering in person. Um, we knew it was a risk, uh, but I'll talk sort of about the questions that we asked ourselves, we asked our board and the action steps we took to actually have an in-person event last year. Um, so the Farmstead Cocktail Party, it's usually about 300 guests. It's at our Mueller Preserve, which is a four acre property. Um, it's the home of our offices, which makes things really easy in terms of setup. The event is mostly outdoors, but we did use our barns for seating and some of the bars and food. So um, over the summer, we did sort of decide we would like to try and do this in person. Um, that was sort of the feedback from our audience. And we said we would um, gauge the level of positivity rates and all of that like every week and just see where we were. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in. The first question we sort of asked ourselves uh, in terms of planning was what is allowed by the law? So we, we, you are gonna check your state and local rules and reopening guidelines for either private, social or recreational gatherings. Um, in Connecticut last September, when we had decided to postpone the event to, uh, the number was 100 people, including staff for outdoor gatherings. So we were like, okay, we're definitely, um, I think we had already sold that many tickets by that point. So we just like didn't promote the event anymore um, and closed out all ticket sales. Because people were continuing to purchase tickets throughout the summer. Um, I think they were all hopeful. So as of March 19th this year, the current number is 200 people, not including staff for outdoor gatherings. Um, and obviously face masks and social distancing are still required. So right now for my event that we have again postponed, not postponed, but we decided it would be in September, hoping we've got lots of vaccinated people and antibodies and all that good stuff. Um, so that's the number I'm sort of working with right now for another in-person event. So once you answer that question, the action is sort of to create your initial event plan that abides by all those laws and rules. Um, you wanna consider the number of people, what your seating arrangements and spacing and tables need to look like, um, how you're gonna do food and beverage service. And you wanna make sure that people feel safe and comfortable at your event. So something that we thought was important was providing hand, si hand sanitizer, everywhere at every individual table at check-in in the bathrooms wherever we could put it um, we also put disinfectant wipes on every table uh, we had extra masks for everyone and we had restroom staff so it was one person in one person out and we were Lysol wipes were available 
um, for everybody to wipe down whatever they needed in the bathroom and the staff person was intermittently like checking also. So now you've got your initial plan. So question two is uh, something Michelle touched on, but how do my constituents or guests feel about this event? Um, so you've got your plan, you're gonna communicate that to a select group. Um, we picked our board and we have usually have typically pretty large event committees. So we have our event chairs and some of the committee members and we communicated what our plans were to them and requested feedback. We also asked them um, to share that information with other people and see like, would your friend come? Would your spouse come? Um, and that was definitely like Michelle said, that was really important. And we um, were somewhat surprised, but we got really good feedback about having an in-person event. Like I said, I think we were really hopeful that the fall was gonna be it. Um, and we were gonna be safe and it was the pandemic was gonna be over. So um, your action step after requesting that feedback and receiving that feedback is to revise your event plan, taking any of that into account. Um, we definitely took a lot of the feedback into account. Again, I feel like we were uh, most concerned obviously about like our image, like we didn't want people to think we were being irresponsible, but at, but at the same time, our audience was telling us like they were comfortable with the plan we were um, sharing. So next, you wanna finalize your plan internally and with any vendors. Make sure your caterer is on board, your valet, whatever other vendor you're using, make sure they're on board with your safety protocols. Um, provide all of your definite and potential guests with information about the event. Be transparent, be clear, this is what we're planning. If I had gotten a bunch of emails saying, you guys are crazy, I think we probably would have um, reconsidered this a little bit. But again, I think people, they wanted, they wanted to get out. Um, ticket sales are a really good way to give you an idea about how the community feels about the event. If you're not selling any tickets to your event, like you might question um, what you're doing. Again, our ticket sales were, trickling in throughout the summer and by the time like it it was I think by August I had definitely had to close everything out and we were like weren't promoting the event at all because the people who had already bought tickets um were again mostly board members people we know we know them personally we know them well so the next question the, the most important question are all the what ifs um what if there is another spike in cases and or guidelines change so that my event is no longer possible what if no one wants to attend? What if my event starts an outbreak, which was the scariest piece of having an in-person event? Um, so your action step there is gonna be worst case scenario planning. So obviously hosting a gathering during a pandemic is a risk. So the level of risk will depend on your audience, the positivity rates in your community and the type of event you're gonna host. So like I said, we know our audience very well. Um, they are, it's an age range. Like we typically have for this event, people in their thirties to people in their eighties. Um, we sort of knew who was comfortable attending and who wasn't by that point. And we were also, although like alcohol flows at the event, people love to mingle and see people they haven't seen, or sometimes it's their parents or their parents' friends. Um, but this isn't like a party party. It's a sort of a short two to three hour event and people aren't um, drinking to the point where we would need to be concerned about them taking the safety protocols into account. Um, they're all like really responsible, smart people. Um, we did decide to like nix any type of indoor interaction, like everything was gonna be outside and the, the bathroom attendant was like one person in, one person out. Um, so there was nothing indoors, it was completely outdoors. We lucked out with weather, which was great, but we did need to communicate through like every avenue possible to the people who were attending, um, the cancellation policy and like what the protocols were if you're coming to this event. So um, the main thing we put on, I think it was like originally on the ticket sales page, I'm just gonna read it to you. It said, please note, the event is subject to change in accordance with local state and federal rules and guidelines. In the event that an evening at the farm said must be canceled, all tickets will be refundable. Um, so we offered that option to guests right away. And that's something you just, you're either comfortable with and you hold the event or you're not. Um, 
we were comfortable saying if we had no expense, we were okay refunding ticket sales to whoever wanted them. Or we did offer the option um, for people to just make it a completely tax deductible donation to the organization. Again, the people that had already purchased tickets are generous supporters of the land trust and we sort of knew um, they weren't gonna ask for their money back. Um, I think one of the most important things is to make sure that everyone working the event, whether it's like outside vendors, your volunteers, your staff, um, make sure they're aware of the safety measures you have in place and is comfortable enforcing them. Because having the catering staff and the wait staff here was, uh, it was great. So when people came, we had the event in September, we ended up um, cutting it off at 80 people and we had like room for 20 staff people. Um, we did tables of two, four, or six, and we reached out to every single person who bought tickets, which wasn't, I think it was maybe 40 people, individuals who had bought one or two tickets. Um, we reached out and asked them, what table do you want? We didn't see anybody without like their consent of who they were going to be sitting with. And if I didn't hear from them, they got a table of two and that was safe. Um, we did say that from the moment you leave your car to the moment you get to your table, your mask is on. The only time your mask should be off is when you're seated at your table. So people arrived, masks on, I had hand sanitizer at check-in um, and the cater, I gave them their table number, which was like clearly marked um, out in our lawn and the catering staff sort of helped them find their tables. But of course the catering staff was also, we, so we did like, wine and water on the tables. So people like whoever you're sitting with, you're comfortable enough to eat with, so you can share bottles. Um, otherwise we had the catering staff with gloves on offering beer, soda, seltzer, all individually packaged items. Um, so they did sort of end up, people did not sit right away because this event is typically like a stand around and mingle event. People were standing in small groups with their masks off while they were drinking. And we panicked a little bit, um, but we said, we just asked the catering staff, we said, can you please just go around and tell people that we're gonna be either, whatever it is, we're gonna start our program, which we don't even have, or we're gonna start passing out food. Um, so if they could find their tables. And once the catering staff sort of nicely asked everyone to find their tables, they did. And they, they stayed at their tables, um, but it would have been a little bit uncomfortable. Like if we didn't have any um, like other staff, like that would have been strange for our executive director to have to go up to like our board members and be like, hey, can you sit down? Because what you're doing is totally against our safety protocols. Um, so it did end up working out. We did not start an outbreak, which was like the best thing ever. Um, so this year we are hoping to move a little bit closer to that uh, original traditional event um, I think we will probably not be using indoor, anything indoor. I think we'll keep it all outside, but I'm really hoping this like 200 number um, either stays or increases so that we can um, have a lot of people raise more money and just sort of move back to that normalcy a little bit. Um, but I guess my, the main and most important things um, is like how I think the feedback from your board and like your your shareholders like are they comfortable with you hosting this event are they comfortable coming to this event we definitely had um, a few people saying you know I'm just not comfortable with it and I was like I feel you I stayed at the check-in table the whole time um, but there was a we did have to end up turning people away uh, because people wanted to come so I think that's the most important thing if people want to come and they're comfortable and they're going to follow the rules I think it's okay to move ahead with the in-person stuff, um, but there is definitely a lot to take into account. So any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, I'm not a huge fan of slides clearly, but if um, Chris can share my contact information or I can put it in the chat if you wanna send an email or anything like that. Sure, yeah, I'll definitely follow up with that, Sophie. And that was, that was definitely interesting. I think it's gonna be um, more and more of a consideration COVID protocols going forward, um, especially when things start to return more. So I think it's going to be interesting to uh, to see how that goes. I, I think it's going to be kind of a, a it's going to progress as we go along. Um, does anybody have any questions for Sophie directly? I see. I, I have one. 
I, I just wanted to ask you, when did you start putting out the Evite, the invitations to people to, for registration for the September so, event? Last year, obviously last year was a little different. We like didn't know. So for this year, we for the September event, we have already put it out. Okay, that's helpful. We Thank did a you. save the date um, and then we did open ticket sales. And again, the ticket, they're selling quickly. Like I think we've already sold 72 tickets. Can you walk us through how you uh, re resolve the liability issue of a COVID outbreak at your event? You know, I think we discussed it heavily, we just discussed it heavily with the board. And I think um, we did for all the invitations. So anybody who bought tickets and maybe a few other people received a hard copy invitation. And we had an insert um, that listed, it was like bullet points of everything that we expect from people. But in terms of like actual liability and insurance, I'm going to be fully transparent. We didn't talk about it. Yeah, and I think also part of that coming from the organization is we um, stayed within the state mandates for COVID. Um, so, so we made sure that the attendance was of the proper number, that the spacing was appropriate. I think there was- We did touch base check. with the town of Greenwich, yeah. like their health department, and they did come and check everything out um, before the event began. Right. So, so yeah, so it was, it was definitely interesting and we, uh, it was, it was good. And our, like our, um, council on our board was part of the conversation and, um, she seemed to feel like the way we were going with it was appropriate. Great. Are there yeah. any more questions for Sophie? Did I just hear one more? Uh, I don't think so. Let okay. me make sure I Thanks, here. Sophie. That was great. Very informative. Thanks, Chris. Uh, appreciate it. Mel, are you are you with us? I am. Great. How are you doing, Mel? Can you hear me? I'm good. Thank you. Good. We're looking forward to hearing. Okay. Great. Let me share my share my screen. Uh, I'm not sharing yet. Am I might no. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay, it's a little slow today. All right, can you can you see full screen? Yes. Okay. So um, uh, I'm Mary Ellen LeMay. I'm the Aspatuck Land Trust uh, Landowner Engagement Director. Um, I do not do fundraising at all for the land trust, uh, which is good. <laughs> I I am the landowner engagement. So I um I I work on the land stewardship of um, our, our members in the four town area, specifically focused on getting people to change how they treat their backyards. So um, just to give a, um, you know, an overview, um, we have something called the Green Carter, uh, which is this area um, that we developed a couple of years ago um, based on ecological models that overlaps are actually six towns. And we do land protection and land stewardship in this 40,000 acre area. This is not all protected. Uh, only 33% of it's protected land. The rest of it is um, people's backyards. And that's the focus of uh, what I do. And um, I thought since I had been involved in the pollinator pathway from the very beginning, it was important for people to see that um, now as a, with my land trust hat on, um, I took a couple of steps back to our original wildlife corridor mission with uh, Fairfield County and RCP and H2H and um, kind of went on a deeper dive into uh, supercharging biodiversity and overlapped pollinator pathway towns um, with the green corridor. So this way I could just continually take my hat on and off whether I was pollinator pathway or green corridor. So um, it it was an opportunity for people to go the next step after the pollinator pathway. Once they were on the pollinator pathway, um, they could then um, begin to understand biodiversity. And that's where the green corridor came in. So the, there are compatible messages. Um, pollinator pathway and green corridor both ask people to plant natives, avoid pesticides and rethink your lawn. So um, 
as opposed to a pollinator, our focus is going the next step up the food chain into um, birds and mammals and really opening for biodiversity. But um, my goal was to get people to take action steps uh, in their backyards. And a key action step was integrating natives into um, their yards. And um, that was gonna be the challenge uh, because the natives were just not uh, available out there to the scale that we needed them to. So thankfully, um, um, actually these slides are out of order, but we decided that we were going to help people by creating a plant sale. Uh, to get these out into the um, uh, into the public, uh, but we, would not have been possible without our partners at Connecticut NOFA and the Ecotype Project, which helped to create the source of um, our true natives uh, for our eco region. So, uh, Connecticut NOFA, uh, it, along with Highstead, um, uh, became the team that went out and collected wild uh, seeds, native seeds, um, sent them to organic farmers like the hickories in Richfield. Um, seed state savers harvested from the, um, uh, the, the gardens that are on the organic farms and then the nurseries. Uh, we use Planters Choice in um, Newtown. Right now, he's uh, Daryl's the only one who, um, at scale, is propagating these plants for us. And um, then the plant sale. This is the piece that we came in at the land trust was getting these plants um, into a plant sale and then out into um, the green corridor and the pollinator pathway. Uh, this is the founders plot up at the hickories. This is Joe Pieweed. Um, these were all wild collected and then planted here in the founders plot and then harvested, went to the wholesaler. And um, this is what the flats look like. Uh, they were propagated in flats of 32. So last spring we decided let's get some of these sold. Um, and the folks in Wilton High School were doing it at the same time. There were only seven species available at that point of true ecotype plugs that were harvested. So it was kind of easy when we started in the spring, this was our spring sale. We had some shrubs and trees, but only these seven species of ecotypes in flats. Um, the cost was $1.50 per plug. Um, our first sale, we sold them for, um, if I recall, it was like $1.95 each. And then the second sale, we just, it was so much easier to just go to $3 a plug. Um, and that um, 50, you know, that markup of 50%, uh, it became um, a, opportunity for people to donate. We allowed people then to write off um, that additional, that upcharge as a donation. So they could write off uh, half of their sale of their purchase. Uh, in the fall, um, the team uh, at NOFA, Connecticut NOFA and um, the, the uh, wholesaler was able to get, collect and propagate 17 species. So we went up to 17 species of ecotype uh, plugs in the fall. So now just to keep in mind, my primary goal was not to raise money. <laughs> it was just really to propagate and get these native plants out into the, um, into the world. So we had no idea how people would buy them. We had no idea how many they would buy. So we never set a goal um, for sales or for money or for uh, inventory or anything. Um, Daryl, uh, we bought from him what we sold. So luckily he was so kind that he didn't ask us for a deposit up front. We just put all the species out and whatever sold, um, then we paid him half of what we brought in. So um, it was kind of good. There was really no, no stress in that way because this was just an experiment. Um, and so with the original spring sale, we, there were seven species, as I mentioned. Um, uh, our intern Paige Lyons, who developed the Pollinator Pathway logo, um, works uh, for us um, uh, for projects and um, we paid her to come up with a design for those seven species, the pollinators that were attracted when the, se the sequence of bloom was. Um, and this was helpful to get people to buy these natives because they had no idea about these ecotype plants or natives. So we just made it easy for them by coming up with these kits. Um, and this was the original seven. 
Um, so we did two kits. We did a native pollinator garden, um, which was a full flat of 32 plugs. And then we did a half flat of um, 16 and we made it into a mailbox kit. So again, just the goal is just trying to customize this, making it easy to get for people to get these out into their gardens. Um, and we provided planting instructions with that. So uh, we expanded in the fall because we had then 17 species. And then after that, um, we added this additional opportunity to get people to understand that just planting plugs is not enough. You need shrubs and trees to create that layered effect. So um, Paige uh, and uh, I developed these hedgerow kits. So one for sun, one for shade, one for wet, one for dry. Um, they were expensive because it included shrubs and trees and the plugs. So each one of these was about $400 and we did sell them. Um, and then we also continued to sell the kits. Plus we sold straight up flats. Our fall sale was um, quite big. We had it at Earth Place in Westport and um, uh, actually Sephra uh, Alexandra from Connecticut Nofa said it looked like somebody dropped a forest at Earth Place because we had thousands of plants and trees and Remember, this is our first plant sale ever, so I didn't even know how to do this. Uh, so organizing them was quite um, a feat. But uh, ultimately, between those two plant sales, we sold over 12,000 native plant trees and shrubs, got them out into the pollinator pathways and the green corridor and beyond. And um, when we looked at the ecological impact um, from those two sales, uh, when we, the shrubs and trees was a total of um, uh, 1,365 native trees and shrubs were sold. Um, and then close to 11,000 ecotype perennial plugs were sold. So um, this is the plant sale loading people's trunks up. Um, the impact on the Aspatuck Land Trust, um, however, was quite remarkable. Um, we, like the pollinator pathway, we have um, our, our signs trying to get people to be, become green corridor partners. Um, our goal last year was 500 new green corridor partners in that green corridor um, region. And we achieved that goal. Half of them came from the plant sale. Um, we had a total of 365 people show a purchase online. All purchases were online. Um, and we grossed in those two plant sales um, $80,000, which we totally floored us. Um, and then, so keep in mind, half of that went back to the wholesaler and half of it was donation to the land trust. And the people who purchased the plants were able to write their donation off or 50% of their purchase was donation that they could write off on their taxes. Um, we ended up getting uh, 46 new Aspatuck Land Trust members. Um, and 68 people who used to be members that didn't, weren't active with us, uh, joined on board uh, again because of the plant sale. And the second plant sale, we did um, doorstep deliveries, which was um, really a challenge. Uh, but, but people were buying big shrubs and trees uh, and they couldn't fit them in their cars. So we took, um, or for $20, uh, we told people we would deliver to their houses and 69 people took us up on that. The whole plant sale was socially distant. People stayed in their cars um, and we loaded the car or they loaded the car and we stayed away from them. Um, so mind you, this was June. So early on in COVID, uh, we all looked like uh, Frito Banditos here standing with our masks. Um, this was at Gilberti's farm where we had our first plant sale. Um, but it just, you know, we set, looked to other models of other plant sales. Um, and how they, they did the, the drive through for socially distant. And um, Dina um, Brewster at NOFA was helpful with us getting the strategy for the cars coming through. And um, uh, we, we, what was key here was our partnership with Planters Choice, the wholesaler, and with Connecticut NOFA and Highstead, which, which really became our supply chain. Um, and for the shrubs and trees as well, they came from Planters Choice. They were all natives, of course, the shrubs and trees were not ecotype, which means they were not wild collected, but they were native. Um, 
And this is Gilberti's uh, farm. This was the first sale. So this is what it looks like when we laid all the flats out with signs. Um, we have this spring plant sale, uh, which I just closed yesterday. Um, we had up to 37 species of ecotype plugs. So Daryl's been really busy propagating. This time we pre-ordered uh, because we knew that people would buy them. So based on the first two plant sales, I was able to calculate approximately what people would buy. And then we had to do a 30% deposit to, um, to Daryl. Uh, and we sold plugs only. So I did not do shrubs and trees now in the spring. I'm gonna do the shrubs and trees in the fall. Uh, so we did just straight ecotype plugs. The same thing with, um, pre-made kits that people could buy, or they could buy whole flats of 32 or groups of eight, 16, whatever. Socially distant pickup this year is May 14th through 16th at one of our nature preserves at the Haskins Preserve in Westport. Um, and as of last night, um, mind blowing, we closed the sale, just plugs alone, we were at 43,000 gross. So again, half of that is, um, is donation that comes to us. Half of it goes to Daryl. And the grand total was 12,500 plugs sold. Um, we kept the plant sale open for a month this time because we wanted to give people time to just continue to peruse. And um, we set up a system where we could manage the inventory based on the sales. And um, we would sell out on products and kind of put little sold out signs on the website. Um, so this way we've sold almost everything that we've purchased. Um, but just for, uh, for data management purposes, we use um, three separate sites, which is a little onerous. Um, we're, gonna, we're working on ways to, to use only one site, but they don't all do what we want them to do. Squarespace is the site that we use to develop our website. That's where we developed the basic graphics for the sale. The actual order site was through our network for good so that we could manage it as donations, as a fundraiser. And then Sign Up Genius was another link for people to schedule when they would pick up. So that was another socially distant um, factor was pick up uh, so that we only had um, three cars every 15 minutes um, coming in. So we manage that through Sign Up Genius. So people pick the time that they wanted to come. So um, every sale, we it gets a little bit easier. Um, and you know, the beauty of this as a fundraiser was we didn't really plan for it to be a fundraiser, and it turned out to be one of our um, biggest fundraisers for the community at uh, large. So that was it. That was all I had uh, up for my slides. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. No, that was that was very interesting. I, I was um, impressed to see. I'm I'm sure how many people you engaged. And going forward in this COVID world, it is interesting to think about um, ways to, to fundraise where you're you're selling something versus like a gala. Um, so that was definitely something that I think we can all kind of internalize and think about how to maybe do something similar at our own organizations. Um, does anybody have any questions? I was just going to point out that um, Westchester is in Eco, Eco Region 59. So, and, and some of the founder plots are also in New York. Um, so there's a, there's a New York side of that story of the beginning of those plants, right, Mel? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So the more that we can spread these, um, into the region and, uh, you know, track actually Sephra was tracking the zip code of the people that purchased. So I think she, I didn't put her map on, but she developed a map to where these ecotype plants have gone in Connecticut and New York. Um, and it's been quite exciting because see, that's the ultimate goal. The goal we set was to get natives out into the broader pollinator pathway area and just like testing this stuff out in the green carter to see if it works. And it, does. So Daryl um, at Planters Choice would love nothing more than to propagate more and more of these plants and get them out to other land trust plant sales. So this is not, we don't, this is not just our plant sale. It worked for us. So take what we've done and duplicate it for your own land trust. Um, and it's a great way to get people to to, to kind of show up and engage. They feel like they've taken an action step and they're putting these things in their backyards. 
and the pollinators are showing up and um, and we know that they've not been pre-treated with neonics and we know that they're local ecotypes. So gives us that comfort of and getting people to get used to seeing these plants and the names and all that. So um, so sometimes, you know, we, we don't set our um, our goals as a financial endpoint. For us, it was ecological, <laughs> the pollinator pathway and the green corridor, just to get these natives out there in the region. So, yeah, and to get people to think about where do where are my these plants coming from? I mean, it's like we are now asking that about our food. Where did where is this food grown, and you know what pesticides were used? But for the plants, it's the same thing. Like, oh, I have to ask: Do these have you know systemic pesticides in them, or are they organic? And I think the the sale and the story of the ecotype project really helps people make that jump that they need to think about where are these things coming from. Mm -hmm. such we, didn't, thing. we didn't know how to even price these, you know, so at a well, dollar fifty a plug, that's what, um, you know, the price that Daryl gave us. And then from there, we didn't know what to do. <laughs> so, uh, but I said, can we ask for $3 a plug? And he said, absolutely. I would ask for a minimum of $3 a plug because these are very carefully curated plants. They're wild harvested seeds, hand harvested, uh, and that go through separate propagation processes. So yes, absolutely you can, you know, and so that, that whole um, uh, chain of distribution and propagation um, is all local. It's all local farms and local wholesalers and local land trusts. So it's a closed circle. Um, that works for us. So we're really kind of acting locally. But and it's also building up the ultimate goal is to be able to have these wild propagated seeds for like the DOT to use, you know, to, to have an inventory of local native seeds. Anyway, I'll stop. I think it's a great no, no, no. for doing it, Mel. <laughs> no, I think it's, it's, it's amazing. You guys have done such a good job. Um, I know the Grand Branch Land Trust, we had a few people what that went over to Aspatuck and, and really use you guys as an inspiration. Um, and the, I think one of the other beautiful things about doing something like this is you're, you've got the stewardship side where you're really impacting the environment. Bell, surprisingly, you guys are raising money doing that, which is amazing. <laughs> and then you're, you're also engaging people. So it's like, you know, you're really hitting a lot of nails on, on a lot of heads. So it's, it's a, a really cool thing. And I encourage everybody to really kind of take that to heart. Um, so at this point, uh, we've heard from our speakers. Everybody did a great job and I appreciate it. Uh, there were two topics that I thought that would be good to cover um, as a group. I don't know if it's appropriate to do breakout sessions in, in a group this size, but this is just kind of a time if anybody would like to share um, any examples of fundraising or successes that their organization has had or um, that they've seen during the pandemic. And, 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 and another thing I think that's important to consider, as we've heard from all these groups, um, or sorry, all these presenters, is what are the anticipated changes and advances in fundraising as we transition to the next phase? Um, you know, we've all been kind of working to figure out how do we adapt to the, the pandemic and the, those really immediate changes. Um, we're getting, people are getting vaccinated. There are bound to be changes um, coming. So. Does anybody have any anticipated changes of what um, what might might be next? I mean, one thing that's so challenging is just the unknown. I mean, you know, the right. whole mm -hmm. like stopping of planning and even with the vaccines, there's just this continued unknown. The only thing that seems certain is if you do it outside, it's better. <laughs> so I, I'm just throwing that out there. I find like, it hard to start planning again, you know, because you just feel like you don't know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it is. It is tricky. Um, does anybody have any other input or any other thing that they'd like to share? I have a quick qu <clears throat> question, Chris. Sure. Um, I, I found all the information provided uh, by these presenters today very, very valuable on a variety of different levels. And I'm starting to recognize that 
there are uh, friends groups and nature centers and networks that I'm associated with that I think would also find this information valuable. Um, I see that this is being recorded. Would we be able to share uh, the video of this meeting with others after it's taken place? Yeah, I'll talk to all the, uh, make sure everybody's comfortable with that and we can definitely share it, if not an outline, but yeah, I think so. Um, but we'll, we'll touch base and make sure with that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Does anybody have anything else to add? I wanted to add that I thought um, all these presentations were excellent and just testament to the rich knowledge that all so so many of you have just in our partnership and I love peer exchange events like this. Um, hope to do I know we hope to do more of them in H2H but um, I, I think it's just so valuable. Um, and you all spoke on sort of different pieces of this fundraising during this incredibly difficult time and um, I think just what an asset to be able to to share with each other um, and and hopefully we can share this in the, the list of the recording for those who couldn't attend I know you, you know everyone's fundraising it all comes down to <laughs> making some getting that those funds and resources so you can make projects happen but um, I really value um, your time and appreciate you contributing. Absolutely. We have a question coming in here. Um, has anybody successfully worked with a development coach? I know at, at, at uh, GLT we did, I think, in 2017. Um, her first name was Deborah, and I could email you um, her full name if you, if you want more information. But she was good. We it was kind of it was a board exercise. So we had her come in and we did, uh, you know, there were sheets on the wall. and There was a lot of drawing. I think it was it was a good exercise. Um, we were at kind of a, a pivotal a pivotal time in the at the land trust here. We had just moved into our headquarters. Um, so I think it was was a healthy exercise. Um, we haven't used one since, but I, I think we got um, good results. I love that name. This is Pamela Corey. I'm the treasurer of Pumpkin Land Conservancy, and we just received a capacity and excellence grant from uh, the LTA, and we're looking to hire a coach to help us locally. So if anyone right, has well, I'll, I'll, recommendations, I'll send you her name. Perfect. Awesome. Chris? Yes. This is Mel. Um, hey, Mel. So I just wanted to to say that one kind of another unexpected um, thing that was turned out to be successful during this time was um, doing lecture zoom lectures and I know most of the land trusts out there have done you know zoom lecture here and there um, but uh, people don't seem to be getting tired of it I think as the maybe as it get, the weather gets warmer they might not engage as much but um, we have, uh, I set up Zoom lectures for lunch and learn, and we, I usually have no less than 70 to 100 people um, that are actually on, and they sign, over 100 people sign up. We had Tallamy last Sunday, um, we had 350 people sign up for Tallamy. Now, we, we don't, we don't ask for money for people to sign up, but I think that might be an opportunity for some land trusts if you asked for you know, $5. Some organizations will ask for a $5 donation for the event. But what actually came out of this, because we weren't asking for money, we were encouraging people if they like these lectures and they want us to continue, um, you know, to join the land trust. So we had somebody after telling me, loved it so much, they gave us $1,000. It was like $1,000. I almost died I'm like, just because of the lecture. So that was far better than asking everybody for, for $5. Um, but when you are able to kind of curate some really nice um, speakers and the speakers are cheap now. I mean, tell me usually in live, he, he charges $2,000 in Zoom, he's $500. Um, so you can get um, somebody to fundraise. What we ask is one of our landscape partners, if they, We'll give them a little um, a little blurb as we announce the speaker, uh, and if they would pay for the speaker's honorarium, uh, which we've had nobody say they they wouldn't, 
even Mo Green, our lawn guy, did Edwina Von Gaal's uh, honorarium. So it's about just contacting, getting, using Zoom as a way to, to not only spread your messaging, but get people to support what your messaging is and and donate. So uh, I, I wouldn't uh, say that people are getting tired of Zoom now. I, I'm going to you know probably take a couple of summer months off, but once the fall comes again, uh, it seems to be a great way to, to do these lectures. I would never have had 60, 100, 150, 200 people show up at a live lecture for 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 these speakers for the most part um but we can do that now with zoom people can sit in their living rooms and you know have wine or coffee or tea and listen to a premier speaker um so i i would encourage any of the groups out there or land trust to to reach out to these um speakers many of them will speak for free um and some of them will have an honorarium but i haven't had anybody over 500 dollars so yeah, we've done that. Um, and what we we're smaller than than you guys, the Norwalk River Watershed Association, but we have partnered with the libraries in three of the four actually of the um, watershed towns. So we end up getting new new members from the, the people that would normally come to library talks. And I think it also works for the library. And we have been doing the noon thing, the noon talks, like the lunchtime thing seems to work. Um, and yeah. it actually has been great. We've get over 100 people signing up for these things so yeah it's, it's a remarkable tool that you know a year ago we would never have imagined um truly i mean we and it took a minute to get good at <laughs> to yeah, get oh, yeah. accustomed There's still sweat every time i put the zoom lecture on to make sure yeah but it's it's definitely worth it it's definitely worth it yeah, as more and more people are now much more accustomed with Zoom, mm -hmm. um, that's definitely an interesting thing and something I had had honestly not thought of about before. It definitely is an accessibility um, factor when you have somebody that's really interesting to speak. So that's that's very cool. Um, does anybody else have any any input? Anything to add? Well, Just a general I, suggestion. Uh -huh. um, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I don't know if everybody knows of David Allen um, on this call. He's like a big uh, fundraiser for land trusts and he has um, like a blog that he puts out every Tuesday. I think it's called like First Thing Tuesday. Um, and it's really, I suggest everybody who's interested in fundraising or has any part of fundraising in, in your organization to sign up for them. It's just, it, it always kind of uh, just makes me think about things that I aren't I'm not typically thinking about or think about it in a different way and it's helpful um to just hear about what other fundraisers and and specifically in terms of conservation um what they're doing so just a tidbit oh that's great thank you yeah appreciate it that's that's a great tidbit absolutely all right well I think this was a great workshop I appreciate everybody's attendance our speakers were great thank you guys so much for uh for shedding some light on this topic um i will 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 continue to do these things and i'm looking forward to uh fundraising 102 <laughs> thank you guys so much thank you for organizing bye, everybody yep, of course thanks, bye. bye thank you chris it's great thanks. thanks thank you